So last time Bartosz talked about pair, which really uh, you, we always write from now on we'll write a b, a a comma b in parentheses if these are both types uh, denotes pair a b. You just don't need to give this special constructor called pair, this type constructor or this data constructor called make pair. And I'm graying out that make here. It's deliberately very light because you don't need it and um, you might get, it's better to kind of get used to, I think, if you, if you don't mind, although people can tell me afterwards if it's just super confusing, uh, that this is a, a type constructor for this, this is a data constructor for this type constructor. So first and second are maps out of a pair, and basically the way we're going to think of pair is what universal properties are all about, uh, which is what today's lecture is about, we have, or talk, whatever this thing is, is. Uh, we have universal properties, and the universal property is like a one-stop shop for maps. So uh, um, a universal property pair is the one-stop shop for maps into A and into B. If you have to hold two things, you have, your both hands are holding a thing, one's a map into A and one's a map into B, uh, you instead could just hold one map into pair. Um, so it's like if we have uh, a, a, a set with three dots and a set with four dots, and someone, everyone in this room picks one of these three and one of these four. Then the set of people in this room is the C here. And so everyone in this room has picked something in here and something in here. Then I could just have them pick one thing instead of two. Instead of picking something in here and something in here, you could have just picked one thing. And so this is kind of the one-stop shop for maps into two things. If you have to choose two things, you could have just chosen one thing. The, the cost is, it's like a big, bigger space to pick in. Yeah? Probably, yeah. Thanks. Um, so this says, like, I know how to get out of pair. I have pair has maps to A and B, and it is the universal thing. Anything else with a map to A and B, anything else with a map to A and to B, will get a unique map to C, uh, to A times B. And so now, next, we're going to do coproducts with their, which are the one-stop shop for maps out of A and B. And then we'll do exponentials, which don't quite fit the nice pattern of one. They're the one-stop shop for maps with a knob, whatever that means. I'll say what that means later. Um, OK, so, uh, so right, um, the idea for universal properties um, one-stop shop. I don't know if that's a good word or not, but for, um, so we have products, that's like A times B, maps into A and B, coproducts, someone gives you um, a map out of A and a map out of B, and you don't want to hold them both as two things, you just want to hold one thing. So you hold a map out of the one-stop shop, the coproduct, and then exponentials. I mean, there's really only like in and out kind of for maps. So what do you do here? This is like, so this is like B to the A maps with A with knob A. Knob is like a setting or knob A into B. This one's a little bit more confusing, but it's, it satisfies this design pattern of exponentials, or sorry, of, of, of universal properties that adjunctions do very well. And so it, it, on some level, it is the same story. But these things are called limits and co-limits, and this is neither. So it's like, in some sense, the same story. Category theory says these two are more similar than this, but there's also a world where they're all three the same. So we'll talk about co-products and exponentials, and that's the goal of today, is to explain those things and how, they, how you see them in Haskell. Any questions? OK. So coproducts in set, there's lots of different categories. There's sets, a, the category of sets. There's Hask. There's um, every post set is a category. Every monoid is a category. But we'll be talking first about coproducts in set. And so suppose you have a set A and you have a set B. 
and you want the one-stop shop for maps out of A and out of B. So that means a map out of something is like an observable. So what if you observe a color for each of these guys? And so someone, there's the set of colors. Um, sorry, you have this, these colors over here. Maybe you have, oh, we have Andrea's very nice chalk. So we'll get this and this. Okay, so everybody in here gets a color, either red or green. Um, and instead of having to hold a, a mapping from each one of these to red or green, a color for each of these, uh, I just want to hold a color for all the elements in one set. What is the set I need? Union. Sorry, union? Okay, let's try it. So suppose I have Um, that. So suppose I've colored every set. So instead of going like this and tell you the color by giving a map, like by giving the arrow of how this maps to the color set, uh, I'm just going to color the dots. Okay, so I have now given you a map from A into color and from B into color. What is the map that you propose, Lee, for the maps? the map out of this one into color. Copy the colors in B vertically. And yeah. The colors in if it comes from the left thing, we'll color it the way the left thing told us to cover it. And if it comes from the bottom thing, we'll cover it the way the bottom thing told us to cover it. Are they disjoint, these sets? Well, that's a good question. What if they were not disjoint? That would be much worse, right? Yeah, because you could have two mappings. You can't have two mappings. Exactly. So what do we really mean by the union? Well, so anyway, this works, right? We couldn't, it worked in this case. And so the question is, does it work in the case where like, the sets are not disjoint? I guess it depends on what, how you deal with that. And the way we're going to deal with that to make it always work, even when the sets are not disjoint, is to, tag, is to do what's called a tagged union or a disjoint union. So the, the coproduct in set, see that's an example of a perfect question because he just clearly was on track and this like guides me directly to what I want to say. <laughs> so the coproduct in set is given by uh, the disjoint, most people call it the disjoint union, but um, it's, it's that you make it disjoint first by tag, tag um, union, by tagging. So what we'll do is we'll say given A and A, what set should we put here for the one-stop shop we'll just go like the set of pairs that are either called left A, where A is in A, union right A, where A is in A. I don't know if that's confusing to you. Um, is it confusing? Okay, so we'll just make it like one comma A when A is in A, and two comma A when A is in the other A. What am I talking about? Um, yeah, uh, let's call this B, and let's say this is B, but if B and B were the same, if A and B were the same, um, this will still work. So let's make sure we can draw it. So suppose we have uh, apple and pear, and the set apple and pear. And uh, Alice comes and she uh, colors each one, and then Bob comes and he colors each one, um, what should we do to make the one-stop shop for this thing? Well, we'll just have like, I guess Alice was color, cover, coloring these, so we'll tag it with Alice. Alice's apple, Alice's pear, uh, Bob's apple, and Bob's pear. We can tag it with whatever we want. Here I tagged it with one and two. In Haskell we're going to tag it with left and right. Um, but this thing, it's a little bit hard to read, but it says Alice Apple ap Alice Pear, Bob Apple Bob Pear. Um, this disjoint union, this tagged union, where we tag everything with whether it was coming from the Alice set or the Bob set, uh, will always work in the sense that, in the sense of the following definition. So let me define for you what the coproduct in any category would mean, uh, unless there are questions first. Okay. So the coproduct in any category 
This is not to say that every category has all coproducts, but if someone says, I have a category C, and here is the coproduct of two objects, they mean the following thing. So, and over here, the cat, what category were we in? Does anyone know? Set, yeah. Let C be a category, and um, C and D objects in C. The, a coproduct, there may be many, but they'll all be isomorphic. You can prove it from the definition. But anyway, if someone says, I have a coproduct of A and B, of C and D, sorry, consists of three things. One, uh, an object um, that we're going to call C plus D, but that's just a name. Uh, two, a morphism, maybe you call it left, from C to C plus D, and three, a morphism right. It's a morphism in your category from D to the thing that you called C plus D, and these satisfy the following universal property. The universal property says that, this, that C plus D is the one-stop shop for maps out of C and D. So if someone else is already holding a map out of C and out of D, for any X in your category and maps, morphisms, L taking C to X and R taking D to X, so they too have a map out of C and D. There is a unique, there is only one more, there is one morphism and only one morphism in C. C plus, oops, C plus D to X such that, so these definitions are always so long, but amazingly this thing gives you disjoint union in the exact same way that product gives you product of sets. So such that um, this diagram commutes. C goes into C plus D, D goes into C plus D, and for any X, so I could write for all X, but I'll just write for any X you come up with, and any L you come up with, and any R you come up with, you pick, you pick the X, L, and R, and I, because we have this one-stop shop, there exists a unique map. Um, I guess we could call this, in Haskell, we might call this either LR, either LR, says, if I'm in here, what do I do to get an X? E if I'm in C, I either do L or I do R, depending on whether I'm coming from C or from D. It's just a name. It's just a guaranteed morphism in the category. But it guarantees that for any other X in L and R, I have this unique um, map from C plus D to X. So this is the coloring map we did before where we we had a color from this thing to, to X. X was color. And by drawing these things red and green, we gave ourselves a map from there to there. We had our maps from here to here that just includes them into the union. That's left and right. And then we got a coloring. So we were able to color them accordingly. Any questions on this? This is co-products. Yeah. So oh, sorry. I meant her first. This is something, um, either L or R. The domain is this new object we made called C plus D. Yeah. Was that, is it unclear that it's supposed to be touching? This exists unique meant there is exactly one thing we could do. Is that good? Yeah. Yes, it becomes, oh, this is just a name. That's, a, that's very, that's completely true. And so if C was empty, the empty set, it turns out that C plus D is just D. So it's another name, it'll become another name for D. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to understand why the uniqueness, why that's uniqueness. 
Right, so suppose, let, let's go back and look at set. Because if you say, why is it unique? What if it wasn't unique? I'd just say, well, that wasn't the coproduct then. So let's go look in sets and ask ourselves why the disjoint union really is the coproduct and why it's unique. So you have to decide whether you think, no matter how I color these two and how I color these two, could there be no way to color these that like agreed? So if you go here and then, if you go here and then look at the color, or here and then look at the color, here and look at the color, here and look at the color, they're the same, right? Is there any way that that couldn't work? I can't tell, if that sounded really fuzzy the way I just said that. Um, let me try again. So, so, um, so pick any sets. Uh, let's say three and four, is that good? Okay, so these are going to be C and D. And pick any X you like. The naturals, naturals, okay. And now give me a map from C to, D, from C to the naturals. So in other words, name a natural number for each of these. And I, my job is going to be able to find one and only one map from this thing. Um, to this. So if you pick anything here, I'm going to send it there and, and I'm going to put a number there and I'm going to get the same, same number you did. There's no choice. I can't do anything but the one, like, if you give me a number like this, 5, I'm going to put a 5 there. There's no choice because this is going to go to five, it's going to go to, <laughs> this number is going to go here and then up, and it's going to be the same as what you did. Does that make sense? Can you give an example of a, uh, an object that is not the coproduct? Yeah, so that doesn't satisfy everything but a uniqueness part. Okay, let's do this one. So you name a number five, six, and eight. I'm just going to name them for you 10, 13, 2, 2. And I, ha I'll, I have to name something where if I go like this and up, I get the same number as you, so I'll go 5, 6, 8, 10, 13, 2, 2, and then I have non-uniqueness, uh, 71. Non-uniqueness. I got to choose, I got like my own space to choose something. And then I, yeah. I also could have made non-existence by like pushing these two both to the 2. But if these had not been re uh, repeated, there would be no way to get existence of a map if there weren't enough. So if there's too many dots here, I get non-uniqueness. And if there's not enough dots here, I get non-existence. Yeah? Um, in the definition, is the end of the sentence such that the diagram Commutes, okay. yes. OK. 24. Ah. Yeah. So in the definition, there's absolutely no notion of order here at all, as in so total, even though we call it left right, but absolutely no notion of order. No, no order. Yeah. Yeah. So can you, um, if you take Z and W and D and funnel them both through the same two, um, why do you have a problem? I don't. So for this very special map that someone gave us and this very special map, uh, this would have been fine. But this says that for all, for any x, okay, the x was the naturals here, and for any morphisms L and R, like, meaning for all, all morphisms, I don't know, for any choice of, for all morphisms, and since I can violate that, I can pick a bad morphism where this goes to three, and now you can no longer find, you can no longer find a function. We have this function that goes like this. And there's no extension, there's no function from this guy to n where this will feel satisfied that you did what I wanted. That, that it is satisfied if they are both? It is satisfied for very particular r, the one where two things went to the same two, to the same natural. For a very particular R, it worked, 
but it didn't work for all possible R. So it's, not a so it's the, the bad thing is not a coproduct. Yeah. And then we make it a coproduct again by doing that and not, not equating any two things or leaving anything out. Yeah. So this definition is a coproduct of two yeah, there, you can take the coproduct of categories. So the category of categories has coproducts. But I think I'd rather wait till afterwards to talk about what it is. Although it's a, basically the disjoint union again. I, I don't want. Yeah, all of the morphisms are now functors. Okay. So in Haskell, how do you do this? Um, in Haskell. You, ha you would write data either A, B. So this is the type constructor. It's called either for a type variable A and a type variable B. You either, so there's two type constructors. Either you can get into this thing by typing left and then something of type A, or you can write, you can type right uh, with something of type B. And if A and B were the same, if they're both int, then we would have this like disambiguation or tagging thing. The left and right are the tags. So here, left is a map from A to either A, B. And right is a map from... The reason I'm doing this double dash, it means comment. And you don't have to write... You don't have to type these. So here's us getting, here, either is the one-stop shop for maps out of A and B. So we have maps out of A and B into either. And um, we have this lowercase either function, which is kind of like tuple. I don't know if I still have tuple on the board. Uh, either, I could get tuple on the board, I suppose, but I think I'd rather have coproduct on the board. Either taking, um, suppose somewhat, can you read off? Maybe I'll have you turn to a partner and see if you can read off the type of either. It's going to be the, thi the universal property thing. It's going to say, I've already defined left and right. You see them there. And now the universal property is for any type variable x, if you had a morphism c to x and a morphism d to x, this, is going to, this either function is going to be the thing that returns a function from either c, d to x. Do you want to try? So turn to someone and either try or say why you don't understand enough to try. And try to understand why you don't <laughs> or what's going on. Okay, let's try then. Um, what I meant to have you say is that if someone gives you a map from C to X and a map from D to X, then you can return a map from either CD, the coproduct of C and D, to X. This is that universal map, the thing that exists uniquely. And the thing I called either CD over there, either FG over there. So how should either be defined for an FG pair? So here F is supposed to be this guy. F is a map from C to X, and G is a map from D to X. So what should it do? Um, well, it should take a, uh, an E, E of type either, C, D. Can you read this? Who, who can read what I'm writing? Like, in the sense of, I see what you're doing. And who, like, has two dozen that is willing to ask what they don't understand? Yeah. I, I think that, I don't know what's clearer. So I was going to write like a case statement and then write the oh, pattern match. Okay. Since we already did pattern match the last couple You think it might be clearer to do it that way? I think so. Okay, let's do that way then. So what I'll do is I'll say, here's the FG, and now we need a function from either CD to X. So either that thing is left of some C thing. C is a variable of type C. Over up here, we might have written like we have this big set C 
and it contains C1, C2, C3. But in Haskell, because case means something, cases mean something, uh, you can't quite do that. So anyway, here C is an element of the type C, and Haskell knows that, that you mean this is an element of type C. So either FG can take things of type left C, something that gets into this either type because it came in this way, and it, can under, it needs to understand what to do if it came in from this way. So what should we do if it came in as left of something? F of C. And if it came in as right of something, we do G of D. And it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like if, if the thing we got here was C-ish, we do F to it, and if it was D-ish, we do, right, we do uh, G to it. And it's exactly the same kind of story as up here. We have a function out of C and a function out of D, and if we want a function out of either C or D, that's this thing, then if it came in from the left, we do one thing, and if it came in from the right, we do the other thing. Yeah? If you were to write this using pattern matching, so not split up into two cases, how would you do this? This is pattern matching. Uh, this is split up into the two cases. One thing you could do is write, or the thing I was planning to do was either fg is a function. So it takes an x, it takes an e, something of either type, and it does the following. It says case e of, and then I, th I hope I get my syntax right, case e, e of left uh, c, then do f of c, and write d, do g of d. Oh, I may not need this vertical, but I could do it. Mm -hmm. I cannot, I can do it. I think I can, I think I typed it in. But um, you can decide which one you think is easier to read. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Uh, I just quickly ask for a clarification between the Haskell syntax and the, the, the diagram you drew. Yeah. The big E there is the code product. That's right, and either A, B, C. So here's my diagram, A, B, left, right, F, G. Either F, G. Oh, okay. Sure, other questions? It's the, this either is representing that universal property that if anyone comes to us with any type variable C, um, X, and any map from C out of C and out of D, we can give them a map out of either, a single map out of one thing. Okay, other question, Eliana. Say again. Oh, right. When you have a type const a data constructor like this, it's that this actually just automatically defines a map of a Haskell function from whatever you wrote to the right of it to this type. So these just automatically come to you. Nelson? I think the an yeah, I think the answer is no. Yep, question? Yeah. So if you come along with an object and you want to, you know, uh, run this morphism on it to return some new object, how is that type going to get resolved? How will it know if it's uh, an A or a B or a C or a 
If you run, if you run a what on a what, sorry. Object, an element of either AB, either CD, or? Sure. Yeah, I come up to this thing and I say, I've got an element of either CD. Right, uh, but it's got to know which side it came from. Right, and that's what this, so it's got to know what side it came from in order to act on it. And that's what these data constructors are for. They are tags that you're not allowed to use anywhere else in your program, except in ethers, uh, that tell you which side you came from. So you will tag your data every time you're going to use it with whether it came from left or right. In the case of the math, it's that um, given something in here, what it, how you implement it is your problem, but what it's guaranteeing to you if you have implemented it or if you, what, whoever implemented it is guaranteeing to you is that anything in here, if you know what to do on A's and B's, it knows what to do on, thing, on these guys. And so it'll probably just check what A did and check what B did. And then this commuting means that whatever A did, if you enter in through left and do, do this thing, you'll get what A did. Yeah? So in this case, either is a type class that's already been defined? Either is, is not a type class, certainly, because that's like a very specific thing that we're not talking about much in here, oh, well. except their functor type class. This is a polymorphic type constructor. Okay. It asks, give me two types, and I will give you a type. Okay, so even though it, you can, so when you're writing code, do you need to create, write this out for any two types? No, we already have, we already have either int string right now. And as soon as we wrote that, we have either int string, we have either bool bool, they're all here because of these being lowercase. If, if we could have defined either int string, I think, as just a single, as just a single type. It's not a polymorphic type, where this would ter be turned into string, and this would be turned into string, and this would be int, sorry, int and string. I guess that's but then, and then we wouldn't get to use left and right anywhere else in our program, except when we're talking about this really specific thing. So it's much nicer to use a data, uh, a type, polymorphic type constructor. Right. I guess I'm not totally clear on the distinction between the polymorphic type constructor and the functor definitions we had either, because both of them seem to be using your type, doing like these functions between types using the types of the variable. Yeah. I think this is probably better to talk about after. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's, yeah, feel free to come up afterwards. Any questions on the math? Yeah. Oh, jeez. How did that happen? When did that happen? Oh, oh, no, no. It was right for a long time, and then I wrote a wrong thing. Okay, there we go. Thanks. Okay, so I want to talk about exponentials next. One thing I would have liked to talk about, I like the question, so I like that better than what I was going to talk about, but there's something called bimap, just like there was for products. We could have said that if I have a map from C to C prime and D to D prime, then I get a map from C plus D to C prime plus D prime. Um, that's called a bimap. It's a bifunctor, and it's, it's a type class bifunctor. Um, but you can just implement that at your seats or afterwards or whatever. You can come up to one of Brendan, Bartosh, or I, me, and uh, Whatever. Okay. Okay, so exponentials, the way I'm saying it, well, let's see. So, in set. Yeah. Sorry, what's the It is a functor from hask times hask to hask. Given two Haskell data types, it'll return a Haskell data type. Given a Haskell function here and a Haskell function here, it'll return a single Haskell function between the results by map. Functor. Okay, um, in general, it just means a functor with two variables or coming from a product of categories. But we can talk about that afterwards also. So in set, suppose you have a mapping of function from a set called, I guess I'll, I'll call it setting, 
or knob, I don't know, setting times input to output. So these are three sets, a set of settings, like you set, you set something in the very beginning. You say, uh, let's set for the entire rest of the course, let's set the room to 4, two, four 137 or whatever. And then, given an input, we get an output. So it's like you kind of set this one at a slower pace. You change this one less often. You're constantly changing the input, but you set this dial at like, at like 3. And you just leave it there for a long time. Then that's the same thing as, sometimes people write an equals sign, like really long, a function from setting. So you fix a setting, and what you're really going to use is this, the, the set of, what you get out is a function from input to output. So like, once they fix the setting, you get this new machine that just has one knob on it, not two. And you're just playing with this knob and getting outputs. So it's like if you have a function from n times n to n called plus, it takes 3 and 5 and returns 8. Then you could turn that into a function from n to the set of functions from n to n. And it would take 3 to the function plus 3. Plus 3 is a function from n to n that takes 5 to 8. So if I'm just going to set this knob to 3, that's a good coincidence. I'm not that good at, at these things. So if I'm just going to set this knob to 3, then I get a machine that, that if I put in 5, I get an 8. And that's currying and uncurring. This equality means any way you can possibly do this, I can do this. And any way I can do this, you can do that. And we'll get the same answers in some sense. And I'll answer your question in a second. But this one is called currying. And going backwards is called uncurrying. This thing is the set of functions for the naturals to the naturals. You might write it nat to the nat, or set nat nat. But given one element in this, I get one element in this, because this is a function. And so given three, I get the one element called plus three, which itself is a function. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, a to the b means the set of functions from b to a. Yeah, so like, let's say a is the set 1, 2, 3, and b is the set 1, 2, which I don't remember if you were here from the whole time, but we used to write, we would write this as 3 and 2. Then what, how many elements does this set have? How many functions are there from 1, 2 to 1, 2, 3? There are, n you can choose where one goes and you can choose where two goes. So you have nine choices. So the notation works even for zero for all numbers. Other questions? Okay, so um, So the way I set it over here, and I don't know if you like it, but exponentials are maps. It's like the one-stop shop for maps with knob A into B. So this was like the knob. Like here is like a knob or a setting. Maybe I should have called it knob instead of setting. From, so it's somehow for if you have a setting and a thing you're going into, it's kind of like, hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that resonates or not, but that's, it's kind of of the same nature in the sense that all three, coproduct, product, actually including void and unit, the, and exponentials all come with, from this thing called adjunctions. So you may, but probably will not have time to get to. So in Haskell, instead of writing A to the B, they write B arrow A. 
which is really, I like it a lot. It's really nice. It's just that you have to get used to understanding if you write f colon b arrow a, are you talking about a morphism or are you talking about a term of type b arrow a? Well, it turns out those are exactly the same. Like they mean the same thing. So it's ambiguous, but in a way that doesn't ever make a problem. Um, in a, what's called a Cartesian closed category like Hask, uh, that will mean the same thing. So in Haskell, we have curry and uncurry as functions. Curry is a map that takes an A, a map from A, B to C, and turns it into a map from, this is pair, by the way. This is A times B. They just don't write product. They do a lot of punning. So punning means that the type A comma B, which is really A times B, is the exact same way you write an element of it. AB is an element of AB. <laughs> it's like super annoying to teach in math class, but really nice once you get used to it in Haskell. Um, AB to C is the same thing as, what should it be? <coughs> what should Curry do given what I said there? Now in Haskell, you don't actually need right-hand parentheses, so we could erase this. Um, I guess we could erase even this. So we could do a lot of erasing here. We could turn this into Either way is perfectly good Haskell, and Haskell will turn these into the same idea. So what should Curry be? Sorry, Haskell will think of these as the same type declaration, I think. So what should Curry do to a map F from A, B to C? Well, it returns a map from A to B or C. So it says, OK, give me an A, and I will do something with it. And I'll give you a map from B to C. What map from B to C should I do? Well, I'll take a B, and what will I do to it? I'll do F of A comma B. It's like you have a thing with two knobs, you know, setting and input, and it gives me an output. I turn it into something that takes an input and then returns a, a function takes a setting and returns a function from inputs to outputs. And then there's also uncurry. So maybe at your seats with a friend or a neighbor, hopefully both, I don't know, uh, try uncurry. What is it? Write, writing down the type of it and then writing down the uh, definition of it. So see if you can do that with someone. Okay, any, any ideas for uncurry type? Actually, maybe I'll just take uh, the definition I heard. So what I'll do is I'll just swap these two. Uncurry goes the other way, right? So it goes from A to B to C and returns A, B to C. And so how do you define uncurry? First of all, what argument does it take? Like, what, what do you plug into it? A function. Let's call it f. And then, what does it do to an ab pair? Actually, before we do this, let me say, if I'd written this in this form, the, a nice thing in Haskell is you don't need all these lambdas all the time. We sh could have said that curry f on a and b is fab. Curry F, it's almost like, yeah. Remember how we had like plus three? This turned into Curry F. And then we applied Curry to F to A and it says, and that becomes a function. This whole thing is like a function that takes a B. And then that whole thing takes, turns into it. Let's see. Okay. Anyone have an idea how we do on Curry F? What do we apply it to? Yeah. We 
plug it, we apply it to a pair of type AB. And what do you want to call the element of type AB? Some people might say, I don't like that. I want to call it AABB. So I know this one's of type A and this one's of type B. But if you're used to it, you could just call it AB. And what do you get? F of A. And what is this, F of A? It's a function from B to C. So we could apply it to B. But we never need to parenthesize if we don't have, like, we don't have to parenthesize here. You can erase these parentheses if you want. And it'll do the correct thing. You can decide whether you want them there because it's pedagogically better, or you don't want them there because it's ugly and they don't need to be there. Yep? What did Curry and Uncurry have to do with the one-stop shop? The yeah, so the, I, so the universal property is that a map from A, B, A times B to anything C, um, there is a unique map. Given this F, there is something called Curry F that goes from A to B arrow C. And there is something we didn't define called a val, which I guess I could have you do after this. A val takes an, a B, to, B C, so we'd write curry F comma ID, like the thing that takes an A B pair, curries the A to get a B arrow C, and just copies the B. And then evals, takes a B arrow C and a B, and evaluates them and gets a C. And this diagram commutes. So it says for all F and all A, um, a map from A times B to C, I can get this one-stop shop for all maps from, with a knob of type uh, A times B to C to I can get this way of turning it into whatever that knob was, whatever type that knob was, and whatever function this was that used that knob A, I can turn it into like this universal knob. The universal knob for B to C's is the function type B arrow C. You've got this knob where one of these functions is a whole like F. And it says eval is like the universal uh, use of a knob to like get a map from B to C. Oh, sorry, C, this is C to the B showing up here. I'll write it that way, C to the B. The exponential object. I, it, I'm going backwards, back between set notation and, uh, and Haskell notation here. Sorry about that. So why don't we stop? Um, we can, you can come up and talk about this, or you can talk about Especially if you wait like five minutes so that people with more basic questions can ask them first. You can ask how all the stuff we've been talking about is the case of adjunctions and what that's about and pullbacks and stuff like that. Other set theory, uh, categorical notions. Okay, thanks.